We will start recording since you mentioned it. My microphone's on. I'm sharing my application, so everything should be good to go. Right. I'm trying to set up Flask, but I don't think I'm going to get it to work. So. So we'll give the uh, four people one more minute, and then we'll get started because there's <clears throat> lots of questions and lots of things to do tonight. Does anyone need a pen? Because you will need a pen. Everybody's got a pen? Yes. Something that you can create legible markings on a paper. All right. So we're going to get started. Uh, so you should each have, this is just like a, a checklist of inventory, a name tag, a piece of paper that's a half size with writing on it, and then Two separate homework assignments that are not yours, hopefully. So that should be in your position. We'll start there. We're going to get to questions on project one after this exercise. So if you can hold those, you all have good questions on those so far, and, and we will come back to those. But we're going to do the activity first because it's uh, somewhat distracting. So, But eventually, after we do question, the, the activity, and then we'll do uh, questions on the project and the timeline, and then we'll talk about automation reports. So that's sort of like the, the big overview for this evening. All right, so as some of you may have deduced, these homework assignments are not the ones that you submitted. They are someone else's. And so this is uh, my personal game of anonymous peer code review. So the assignments have already been graded, so there's no pressure to like you know, sway anything with that. This is for you to look at someone else's code and try to read it. Right now, you've done the assignment, so you know you have at least some conception of what the problem being solved is, and maybe a method of how to do it. And so the goal is to like show you this is how someone else thought about that exact same problem. Right, and it's just far away enough in the in your memory. Like you didn't literally just do it; you did it like a week ago. Right, and so it's far enough away that you don't have your exact solution in mind, right? But it's something that you should know how to do in some sense, right? Or at least you have tried to do. So with the paper that you have and the implement, either a pen and pencil, um, you're going to write on those assignments. So they're all printed out so that you can write on them. So I went through all this trouble of printing all the assignments twice so that you can write on those assignments. And this is what I want you to write on those assignments. Right? Basically, <laughs> and, and if you think ahead, what kind of comments would you want to get feedback on, right? Like that's sort of the, the objective is you're doing someone else's service and they're doing it for you. So you're going to, when you get your assignments back, you should get two sets of assignments, they're both yours, right? But they'll be reviewed by two different people. That's why you're reviewing two different homework assignments. So that's the goal, right? That's the big picture overview. These are the questions. Oh, sorry, just pointing out a thing. That wasn't the thing I wanted to point out. Right, that was sorry. That was the logistics. This is the set of questions that I want you to, to to convey or answer back to the author of the code. 
So now that I have the right slide up, <laughs> you can see what I'm pointing at. So uh, basically, like documentation, right? Can you read what the author is intending to do? That's what I have to do every time I read every one of your assignments that you submit as, as homework. I'm trying to debug your head, right, by looking at the code. And documentation can kind of help with that to say, this is what I intended to do with this snippet of code. So read through these. I'm not going to read them to you, but then write down your commentary on someone else's assignment. And then we're going to go through the very messy logistics of getting those papers back to the original author without knowing who wrote what. Other sort of like super obvious point that I'm just going to make really explicit, you should write so that someone else can read what you wrote. I'm, I'm, I'm deadly serious. We'll have a failure rate of about 30% on that mark, right? Like 30% of you will write something that is unreadable by any other human. Is this for us or No, it's so sorry. That, uh, that, I'm good to The half sheet of paper is for a separate activity later in the evening. So yes, please place that aside. That is for the end of class. We'll come back to that. But for this, this assignment, you're just looking at those two separate homework assignments, writing on them, answering these questions, and then we'll come back to those logistics slides of what we're going to do with these. But I'll give you some time. Dan, did you have a question? Yes. Um, the homework was to the score for two different files, right? Correct. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that. So th this is, so I'll go through and mark these up just so people get coming back. And some of the sheets are double-sided, so make sure that you're looking at um, all of the content. So if you're just joining us, come up and grab your, your name tag. Yeah, so just grab your name tag, and then these are homework assignments. And then you're going to write on the homework assignments answering those questions. So there's two homework assignments for each person. If you guys have questions about what we're doing, just let me know.
Come up and your name tag. So these are two homework assignments from other students. You're going to write on them. This is for later. You're going to write on these to answer those questions. If you have questions about the code and you're just like totally confused, be sure to write that down. So we're going to use, so these are another person's homework assignments. So after you write your comments on this paper, we're going to return these to a different person so they can get back to your phone. So these, these will come in handy to use later. That's for a different activity later in the class. Yeah. Also, you should not write your name on these pieces of paper. You're the anonymous reviewer. So the two questions I've gotten are, what assignment did you give us? That's the question that you should write down on the piece of paper, right? If you don't understand, like, what is this doing? That, that's a very good question to ask the author.
So we'll take like another two minutes to wrap up your comments that you're making. If you haven't got your second assignment, you should definitely get the second assignment. But we are going to take the next step of redistributing these homeworks. Uh, and I will watch the parade. Oh yeah, and if you have compliments for the, the author, you should definitely write compliments. I totally forgot that. So good things are good to say. All right, so we'll wrap it up and we're going to start the next phase of the process. So I'm going to describe to you, and you can keep writing apparently. Um, so what we're going to do is on every single assignment, there are two numbers. One is the, the mid, for the middle person, and one is the end, for the end person. So phase two is to distribute the homeworks that you have to the appropriate person with the mid ID. So look at those. You have two every three mid IDs that you're going to have to pass the homeworks back to. And this is the person who you have to get it to. And you might notice there's an all-to-all -all contention issue. Yes? OK, so, so, so you have a mid on both assignments, but there's a number. Yes? So for each of those numbers, who is that mid person? Don't tell me, but just think of it. I think deliver that assignment to the mid person. <laughs> so both my mid numbers are the same. Yes. So you will have one delivery to me. Okay. So that's that's, that's not the all for like the Correct. Okay. Yeah. So there's still comes I see the faces are confusion, so let me know what the questions are. <laughs> 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 what 
What are you looking for? What's the number? 7805 7, for the mid? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, probably 7865. I'm sorry. Does it look like a 6? Okay. Joseph. Who? Joseph. Yeah, it'll take it. Does anyone have a 631? Make. <laughs> 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 so after we deliver to the mid, we're going to do a check. All right. So just. Don't get all antsy yet. Wait, who are you looking for? Who is it? Oscar is in the back. Who's John Jim? John Jim. There we go. Who are you looking for? What's the name? Doran. He's up in the back. Are you here? You're going to have to get to him and like make a physical connection, right? <laughs> Let's see, so I've got 63. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we review this again? Not, not yet, no, no. So, so once you've got your paper, hold it. So, yeah, did you deliver? Uh, that may be the case because I have two in my hand. So, okay, so as you are currently the mid person, so make sure that the paper that you have, this is important has your number on it, right? So suppose that I were Travis, if I were Travis, I would look at this chart and say, do I have mid equals 6222? Yes? Yes. All right. So everyone should have their mid documents. Okay? All right. Yes? No? Which poetry one for? Oh, I can't what you said. Yeah, it should be the same, the same one. You should have two mid documents, the same number. It's like a random shuffle. You get it, you're getting it. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. No, we're not. <laughs> this is a lot of work. All right. So now you are the mid person. You're going to be delivering the papers that you have to the end person. You obfuscated it so no one else will actually initiate. Boom. Yes. All right. So again, look at your end. Oh, wait, wait. This is the mid chart. Yes. Boop, boop, boop. So, all right. This is now phase three. And then I'll deliver to the end person. <laughs> I know, this is a lot of work. I apologize. Yeah, I like the the no. All right, moving on. 80, so I have to deliver this to the end first. 81. Yeah. The question is, did you generate these numbers from Python? I did not. They actually came from Atlas Secure Data. I got yours. So we're. I don't know where left. Oh, here we go. This is not me. This is not me. This is not me. What number what, is your end number? Mine's 5920. This is not. But what's, what's the end number on that one? 101. One. So you need to deliver it to the dungeon. So apparently I have both of these. Do you want to talk? Yes, it does. So, 
Yeah, so those and Android, those go to this is John, can you pass up again? And and who do you have? Got the lever. All right. How are we doing? Does everyone has their own assignment? That's a big question. Yes. <laughs> All right. All right. Now we're good. Woo. Thank you for suffering through the day. That was very exciting for me to watch. Nope. <laughs> yes. All right. So so now we have two sets of questions. Questions on the homework assignment. So did I go over a figure? No, I did not. Right. So why did I not go over a library that would clearly be beneficial to you? Questions? I mean, like, so, so, because you want Well, no. So, so the question is, like, what I was trying to inspire was, you can solve the homework independently of finding the library. That is absolutely what I would say. Forty to fifty percent of the students did. Right? <clears throat> Some people, for whatever reason, found Faker. Right? Now, the psychology of why that question popped into their head, I don't know, but. Um, so some people did find paper, others did not. I didn't. There's no significant difference there in terms of the outcome for grade. Okay. Now I have us. Any other questions on the assignment itself? Actually, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, what number did you use the, as your input for the assignment? Number as input. Like hundred thousand. How many did you want that? I didn't want a certain number of results. That wasn't my goal. I'm not sure if I'm connecting there. The reason I'm asking because it was a three-minute uh, uh, yes. description of it, yes. and a lot of the code, um, especially if you're calling one of these packages, it took a lot to generate over. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Possible. So, so okay. So uh, his question was, <clears throat> if you request too many fake entries, then it will exceed the three-minute limit on the, the rubric for the assignment, right? So that that is true. I did not. Um, I'm not. I'm not formulated a better answer to that in a few minutes. But I was basically looking for an output of arbitrary size. So yeah, if it ran anything in less than three minutes, then that would absolutely be fine. But it wasn't like it needed to. I think what you're asking is like, did it need to get a thousand outputs in less than three minutes? Or something like that? Is that what you meant? Right. Because in, in my mind, if you're going to look at JSON or Excel, you're going to in anything is game as far as random. You have a one to output. My goal was to make sure that if I generate that, I'm able to generate in three minutes and spend two hours making sure that it did. <laughs> Not all those did that. Well, you didn't put that in the rubric. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think what you're saying is that I, I should have put some threshold of minimum number of generated in a certain time. Is that what you're saying? I mean, you put the time in there. I mean, it would be nice to know. It's like, what is the minimum um, that needs to generate within a timely manner? Yes. That way, I'm not spending my will. Right. So Make before sure you. That. Before you, next time, I mean, this applies to everyone, right? This is why I'm having this as a class wide discussion. Before you invest two hours, please email me. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> the next time you'll also know it. <laughs> all right, all right. I apologize for being unclear, but I'm not going to change my way. <laughs> all right, so questions on the, um, the anonymized homework review assignment, like, did you all understand what was going on? I mean, like that that eventually is sort of caught on for some people. Um, I think there might be some students who are still confused about what we did, but was there value in that? Did you understand the instructions really? Okay. Actually, something that was like blatantly wrong with my code that would for one of the functions wouldn't work. I, like literally, like someone solved it on like the first like two lines of the definition or the first one. So I was like, that was good. Okay, so so I want to. I think the, the I'll generalize it to say there is a diversity of wisdom and knowledge in this student body here, and so that means you should talk to your other students as well as me. So, yeah. Any other comments on the anonymization process, or we're just happy with that. So we, so there's a couple different things, right? We we do like someone will come up to class and and present their homework, right? That's a thing that we can do. There's also the pairwise sort of like comparison of how I did the homework, right? That's another activity I will be doing. And then this anonymized sort of peer code review is another tactic. So 
all of these are just basically to ex explain, justify, and review and critique code. Right? That's a very useful practice when you're trying to develop your own code skills. All right, moving on a little bit because yeah, we have time to actually do some classwork. Uh, so today, uh, again, this goes back to my confusion that I introduced about the order of the dates. So today is going to be a lecture. Uh, next week, we'll be doing the presentations. I sent out an apology email because in Blackboard, it hadn't changed the assignment to reflect that. So the Blackboard assignment of turning in your notebook for the presentation, that's due after you give the presentation. Questions on that? Okay. There were a few questions on the project. I think I have a slide on that. Yeah. So there is a rubric. If you haven't seen the rubric, and, and this caused confusion in the past, there are three tabs in the rubric. So each of the tabs has like your grade, right, for my calculation purposes, and then like what you turned in um, and the presentation. So you can see sort of like what I'll be grading you on. And it's intentionally underspecified, as usual, right? <laughs> Get the head nods in the back. So, so why do I do that, right? Like, why is this rubric not clear about what I'm looking for? Does anyone have a guess for that? Flexibility. Flexibility. Okay, that that could be one thing. It's not my. It's based on a person. Basis. It's per person, absolutely. It's totally subjective, right? Not everyone, as this code review may have demonstrated to you, not everyone's at the same level, right? So that's one difficulty I face is like I can't hold everyone to the same standard. But also, that's like a secondary. My primary objective is that I want you to be have to not only like execute code, but execute some creativity, right? What present what visualizations make sense for your data? I can't tell you because I'm not looking at your data. That's something that you'll have to figure out. And you can talk to me or anyone else in the class or the class tutor, Kavita, right? There's resources to talk to people about. I have this huge data set, and I don't know what visualization makes sense. That is absolutely a legitimate question. I haven't demonstrated a whole bunch of visualizations. Right? Last week, there were a couple. But uh, you should definitely think about asking those questions to people around you to figure out what does make sense to present. Same thing for characterizations. Like, What do I mean as a characterization? Like, What is that? Well, in the data cleanup class, we did spend some time talking about how to characterize like the variable types and how many rows, right? How many sudden? What are the different columns? All that, like, those are pretty straightforward things. But then you can also do like the data cleanup portion, right? How many missing entries are there? Are there type? Are there mixed types in a certain column, right? What did you do about that? So all of this is sort of like the prep work before you do the, the exciting sort of machine learning type stuff, right? Like, or some like linear regression or like whatever you want to do. Like, this is the first part of the data science process. Right? Questions on that? We got. Yeah. In the rubric, there's uh, categories of uh, scores, and some say code, some say constraints, some say written. Yeah. When it says written, does that mean written has comments in the code, or is there a separate written something other than written? That's a good question. So, so in Jupyter Notebooks, there's code sections, right? There, the code cells, and there's markdown cells. And in the code cells, you can have sort of the, the hashtag type Python comments, right? So whether written refers to the markdown or the hashtag code cells, I don't I don't care how you fit your documentation into Jupyter, but it should be integrated into that document. So like with the assignments, I advocate putting the description of the assignment at the top of your Jupyter notebook as a markdown cell. That makes it very clear what problem you're trying to solve. And then you can go back and check that I do all those things. In the notebook, right? It makes it a little bit easier to have context switch. So yes, the writing is integrated with the code, either as Markdown or as a Python comment. And if you weren't previously aware, the Markdown cells have JavaScript support, so it means you can write all the HTML forwarding, formatting, and like there's Markdown language, so you can make it look very pretty, and, and it's pretty fancy. But text is perfectly good. That's good. I don't know. If you happen to get into the Jupyter notebook, can you just show where the, I guess the button or something you push for marking? Ah, yes. So I will totally divert over to that. Let's make it. So the question from Jack was, what does that actually look like? Let's see if we can pull up the notebook quickly. Mm -hmm. 
right. I'm going to switch this back to not being dark, but for now it's dark theme. All right. So, so this is my blank notebook that I'm running. I'll even close this. And if I type some code like print hello, it defaults into being a code cell. So it's that code button up top there. And so if I hit shift enter, it'll run. But now I can change the cell that I'm in over to markdown or raw. Those are my other two choices in this. So if I now I'm in a mark cell and I just say like hello. Yeah, I'm gonna change it to the theme present that up to look a little bit more normal, but basically it doesn't execute it as Python, it just thinks it's markdown. And there's things that you can do, so there's formatting. Like if you put a hashtag in front of it, normally in Python that would be a comment, but in the markdown language that Jupyter uses, it becomes like a uh, an H1 tag with a numeric index in front of it. And then you can do like if you really want to get into the fancy sort of HTML stuff, you can say like a href equals think. You can uh, like this is a variable. All right, so you can you can uh, use HTML. That's the the link syntax there that I put in, and then uh, you can also use the Markdown language to do other things. So all of that makes it look like it's just part of the, the notebook rather than actual code. And I can just execute other cells, and then they're, they're going to ignore that markdown cell. So then the last question is, like, why would I use the raw marking, right? So like, there's this third option here. What is that good for? Well, often there are little code blocks that I want to leave in place for reference, but I don't want executed as a cell. So I use the raw. Um, marking to sort of like, I don't actually need this cell executed every time this notebook runs. So I'm just going to change it over to raw. And then it still, it doesn't get formatted into markdown. So it doesn't like, it doesn't look like it's markdown, but it's also not code. Like there. So it's, it's a way of like leaving code off to the side without Jupyter trying to get confused about why it's markdown syntax and it's not. So that's, that's the, the use there. Yeah. Other questions on anything else related to that? Yeah. Um, so if you're doing data, you know, so for example, if you're changing a data type to category and you're doing it like five times, mm -hmm. do you have to, like I'm assuming the first time you do it when you're presenting, you explain, but would you have to like reiterate yourself the next five times or just say like I repeated this? So there's two questions in there. One is you definitely don't need to so walking through your code, I think the question is like do you walk through every single line of the code or do you just sort of explain the concept and then move on to the next concept? I would definitely advocate for this type of presentation, we're just gonna cover concepts. Like or we're like a formal like team code review and you're literally stepping through lines, that might be appropriate. But for a presentation to your sort of like classmates, this is just a conceptual presentation. That said, if you want to run out your four minutes of required presentation time, you could definitely step through every line and bore for the depth, but I don't recommend that. I think so, even if so, all we have is just like this small sort of data frame of, you know, relatively straightforward data. We're not doing anything complicated to it. It's still pretty straightforward to spend, I think, four minutes saying, like, this is where I got the data. This is the questions I could ask of the data. This is the problems I ran into with pinning the data. This is the characteristics and the visualization. There's so it's sufficient content to take up the time, if, even if you just hit a high level. Okay, so yeah, but then back to your coding question. If you implement the process repetitively, you're just doing copy paste. There are better ways to do that, so I can help with that if you want. Okay. So I'm going to give you a five-minute inspirational talk on why we automate things, and then go on break. So we won't actually do uh, any hardcore stuff here. This is like the most common response to, there's more work. We'll get more people, right? 
that sounds reasonable. People are expensive, so we'll get really free people or cheap people. We'll call them interns, right? Don't pay them any money, get them coffee. Has anyone here worked in an office and had that experience of like, we have too much work, get the interns? Yeah, we have a, one, two head downs. All right. So this is my personal experience of like work shows up, people immediately think, well, we'll just throw more bodies at it. That, and that is, you know, a reasonable approach in that they are free and, and you can get more of them <laughs> for whatever reason. But they're not actually free, right? They take up floor space so you can send them home. Or they, they use computers or they can bring their own, right? And so, and but they definitely take, right? Like you have to give them instructions and like care and feeding, otherwise they're not gonna be productive. So at a minimum, they take your attention. So in, the, in that sense, they're not actually free. Or <laughs> you can say, I'll just, I'm a data scientist. I know how to work hard. I, I'll do this all myself, right? That's also an approach that people take. And it doesn't also scale very well. Um, and there's all these steps you have to do, right? Like you have to, Get the data. You have to do the, the the data characterization. You have to set up your environment, right? And then like you have to send it off to your consumer, who's not going to consume a notebook, so that you can give them either an Excel spreadsheet or a PDF or a web page. And it's just a lot of work, right? I mean, like, no joke. This class is a lot of work. So <laughs> that doesn't work very well. And like, get this, right? This isn't a one-time task. They want this quarterly or weekly, right? That's super annoying. <laughs> if you've written like a weekly report and you're just like dreading it every week because right? you know it's coming you know it's required and you don't want to do it that's totally reasonable all right <laughs> so this is my pitch right my pitch is we will solve those problems today <laughs> it sounds grandiose but it's totally achievable right i'm not saying you'll never do work again but you can definitely automate a lot of those things we talked about right creating documents editing things like making web pages even sending emails, right? Like that is super cool. You can send an email from Python <laughs> or read them, right? Or categorize them, respond to them. All things you can do from Python. Huh? Absolutely. Yeah, auto replies, right? Everything. Yeah, John. Uh, this is like a dumb question. Actually, I'll wait for you to answer this. It's a question. Or like, let's say you have someone waiting. Yeah. <laughs> All right. If we don't, so if I do not answer that question by us, remind me. All right. So I think we'll take a break and then we'll do a little bit of history. But those are your motives for coming back to class from the break. Oh, uh, we'll come back at seven to seven. So John, to clarify, when you set a service that waits like a, a web service, or like what, what do you what's 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 pitching to it? So uh, receiving one. Let's say let's just say you have uh, so here's here's my phone. Okay. If I have something you know, I've written a bunch of code that can go over in the same yeah. Like how do I then set it up so so there's actually one tactic that so the question is like the host that the chat service is running on how reliable is it is it that always on or is it really on your desktop and they run when you logged in? Well yeah, like so let's say you had a computer that was always available. So the, my easy solution to that, especially if it's a scheduled issue, is that like I have tasks that run every 15 minutes. And in Windows, right, using the Windows task list, so is that what you think? Is it event driven or is it schedule based? It's like waiting. So, so it's like, let's say a task is literally looking at folders to see if I can survive. Yeah, so then and I think you're pretty much stuck in a while loop. But like, you know, every minute it checks for the file directory and see if there's a new file in it. So, how do you? Like, oh, like, uh, like, wait a second. Yeah. 
time does. So. so so like you just have a loop that's sitting over whatever time you think is reasonable. So I often get the question of like, are there official homework solutions? I haven't written a solution to any of these problems. We're writing for you. No, I won't even need, so I agree with you, I, but I don't even use any of the students as the official solution. Like, <laughs> it's objectively dynamically graded <laughs> by me. Yes. So I, I think that so that's the intention behind um, people presenting their solution. Um, but I don't have a good way of like making sure that some one like there is clearly people who are more advanced, and I don't want to have undue influence from just a few people, right? Like I don't have a good solution to that problem. But like if if one person recommends like reliably the source of the a solution or design. That's I don't know how to avoid that. Thing. Okay, so we've almost got everybody there. All right, so this next bit is just a little bit of context to make sure that you don't feel like you're doing something totally new and radical, because automation is really old. All right. So the underlying sort of like principle that motivates all this, this work of automating is that we can do a lot of work, right? And a lot of work is repetitive, right? Imagine working in the fields for your survival as like a peasant. Like, I, I, I can't do that. Like, it's work. So luckily I live here. Um, there are things that humans do that are repetitive and like not so manual work, but it's sort of like intellectual work. So the thing that makes this more relevant to data scientists is that it used to be that we didn't have every student with a laptop, like if you can imagine, right? There were actually people 
called computers because they did computation, right? And so what does that actually mean in practice is that you'd have some mathematician, like some complicated equations on the board or like wherever they did them. And then they would take that work and they would give it to a bunch of women who did the math, right? the actual computations, like logarithmics, tables, and divisions, and additions. And they would just sit in large rooms doing math. Right? And that was the computer. So if you can see the sign, it says computing division. So this is like NASA would have rooms for these people, right? Because they needed a bunch of computation to be done to figure out where the rockets are going. Right? That's kind of important. There's this really good movie. If you if if, the, if this is like mind blowing for you, you should definitely see this movie because this mind is this movie is mind blowing, right? Like it's really good. So, uh, yeah, I recommend watching that if you haven't. Uh, question: Has anyone seen that? A couple of positive reviews. Yeah. All right. The computers were actually the world was really almost like calculating projections for our brain. Exactly. So. We had a huge need. We have we have an insatiable like we, the world right has an insatiable need for computation. If you haven't figured that out yet, and so like we would we did that before we had computers. But. All right. So that used to be like computers were really good at doing things like like electrical computers were doing good things that humans could also do, right? But at some point, that that balance changed, right? Computers can now do things that humans cannot. That's a huge shift, right? It seems like a little, oh, yeah, it's just a minor change, but no, computers can do things we cannot. That, that should blow your mind, right? We did this thing to make our lives easier, and then we got surpassed. That's cool, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> right? If, you, if you're kind of aware this is a good so like, story to tell yourself, like, we taught a computer how to play chess, and then it beat us. The smartest of us in such a chess. All right, so activity time. So you're going to talk to your partner about an article that both of you have read. So find someone you haven't talked to recently and talk to them.
Okay, we're going to give you two more minutes and then we'll wrap up. that engaging you're certainly welcome to talk about them outside of class like <laughs> you're not literally talking to your, your co-workers in class right all right so we're gonna <laughs> this is sort of the fluff, soft fluffy section of automation so we'll get to some technical stuff soon but uh, it's coming so the question is who should automate what task right and so we're gonna ask the, the who question first and <laughs> My answer is always, I start with me, right? I'm, I'm very selfish. I want to figure out how can I make my life easier? That's almost always my focus, right? And so the first step to doing this is to figure out, are there things that are happening over and over? If the answer is yes, those are great opportunities to figure out how to automate those recurring tasks. Whether it's scheduled. So John and I were talking between on the break, you know, early asking, is it scheduled? Is it sort of like every 15 minutes, right? Or is it sort of, event driven, right? Is it every time someone hands me a thing I need to do a thing? In either of those cases, there are repetitive tasks, schedule or ad hoc. And so as a data scientist, you'll probably be running into this over and over in your life. So therefore, it makes sense to figure out for each of these tasks, is there a way that I could make this automated so that I don't have to do it manually every single time? Okay, the other sort of like big branch of automation is automating other people's work. It's, it's kind, of, kind of tricky, but it solves. It can be useful because it solves a problem, right? So let's say you show up on a new job. No one knows you, right? No one knows your background. No one knows your history. No one even knows why you're there. Right? They're not even clear you're an employee. But, um, but you have to build a reputation of credibility and trust with that, with that new group of people. How do you do that, right? Well, one thing is to just swoop in and say, like, give me all your data and I'll solve all your problems, right? Like, obviously that doesn't work. So... <laughs> One tactic is to come to people, understand what they do, like talk to them, right? And then once you know what they do, ask them, would you like help making your job easier? Some people will say yes, others will say no. <laughs> now that's it's a, it's a tricky question, right? But basically this solves the cold start problem where if no one knows you, you can build a reputation by making people's work easier or more efficient. All right, so, so you can demonstrate your skills, right? It demonstrates that you know how to code, you know how to use a computer, 
you can help people, you're adding value to the organization. Those are all good things. Right? And so it also helps you understand what other people are doing in the environment because you're definitely going to be working with them and figuring out what they're doing. So as a data scientist, this is like all around goodness that you can definitely exploit once you know how to do these things. And by the way, so this is like a little uh, foreshadowing. This is the motive for the homework. There are some dangers, right? <laughs> if you come to someone and say, I'd like to make your job easier, more efficient, more productive, their answer can sometimes be no, which if you're, if you're not emotionally prepped for that, you will be like, what the, like, <laughs> why did they say no? Like, I can't help, right? But you have to think of it from, from their perspective, right? They've been doing this job for years, if not decades, right? They absolutely know how to do their job, no questions asked, right? And what you're threatening is to take away their power and the thing they know how to do, right? And so you say, I'm gonna make your job easier or more efficient. What they hear is things are changing. Right? And I'll have to learn something new, which requires work, and that causes fear. Right? And so like, the answer of no shouldn't actually be that surprising if you think about it from that, use that, that person's perspective that they don't know what new means because it's unknown, right? fear. An emotional basis for the action is totally rational from their perspective. Okay? <laughs> now you're emotionally prepped because when you come to someone and say, I'd like to help, and they say no, you'll be like, ah, I recognize this. Right? Now I can deal with it. All right. And then <laughs> the other threat is that like, people that just like give you crap work that doesn't add any value and like that's annoying. So all right. So those are the two people, yourself and others. <laughs> that's who it applies to. All right. So now I'm going to show you, um, and so we're just about working our way towards the actual work, but <laughs> I'm going to show you that automation is already huge in your life and you probably may not even recognize it. The reason you're here, you're using laptops, you have all these electrical cords, right? These are all sort of examples of you're benefiting from someone else's effort at automating work, right? <laughs> you got to go to a store, give them some green dollar bills or a plastic card, and they give you this computer that does all this magical stuff. You didn't invent the computer, you didn't have to invent the architecture, you didn't have to invent the chip, you didn't have to invent the display, the hard drives, right? All that came with this little piece of paper exchanging on a piece of credit card, right? Like, that's amazing. So how did you get here? Right? Well, it turns out at, at some point there were people who said rather than having a room full of women doing math, we could have these machines to do it, right? <laughs> and we'll use women to run the machines because that's apparently the thing that they did. But um, so this is an example of a, a really big old like room size computer, right, that does one function basically. You think of like a Python function that does one thing. This is a computer that does one thing. And the way that you reprogram that computer is you physically recable all the computer, all right? That's the work. But why would they do this, right? They did it because it was more efficient, more effective than having a room full of humans doing work, right? Because if you had humans doing it, it was, you know, a questionable reliability. You'd have to have multiple people doing redundant work. Here you could have uh, vacuum tubes, right, and run all these relays for electrical switches, and it would be faster and more reliable, and you could program it to do different things. Right, so like that's a huge change, but it's automation because now we don't have to have people do it. So that's a good thing, right? Sounds reasonable. Well, you continue down this path for the next like 60 years, and now we get to the, where we are now, right? So every time that we try and make something faster and cheaper, right, by taking away someone's work, like those people switching computers and cables, they're no longer employed, by the way, right? So you're removing somebody's work opportunity, but all these abstraction layers of like, you don't have to focus on things, that adds value to the end user. So that's typically why automation gets done. So we get smaller and smaller computers that are cheaper and faster. Those are good things, but it's basically obfuscating the fact that you're taking away someone's job, right? <laughs> that's what the article is about. You're losing that work, but you're making things faster. So that's good. So. All of this, that's just like a historical view. Now I'll do sort of like a ground up uh, view. So it used to be that the people programming computers had to write in this weird set of ones and zeros lang uh, language that you probably haven't seen. So this, this is what a programmer would write for assembly, like move bits on a computer. That's what they used to have to do. Right? And then we had this great idea. Well, rather than having full instructions to the computer about moving ones and zeros in memory, we could have programs 
that do that work for us. They automate the work of having to write that code. Like that's pretty magical because now you've just saved a bunch of work, right? You've saved time. You have you can do things more quickly, more nimbly, more complicated in this very concise language. Look at how small that is, right? That's really cool. Awesome. Well, then you can even see your languages, which are even higher level abstractions, right? So on your computers, you typically don't write assembly. You don't write C, right? All of you, you're learning Python. Why? Because it's a more convenient language that abstracts away the complicated work that you'd have to do in C for memory management. So this is a really nice feature. And so it doesn't end there, right? We don't write everything in Python. We use these libraries because they abstract away all the work. So someone spend a bunch of time writing NumPy or scikit-learn, all these libraries to abstract away the work that you would otherwise have to do yourself. So they've automated, like you call a NumPy function, it does a bunch of things for you. That's automation. So this is all sort of like making your life easier through software abstraction layers. That's automating work that you would otherwise have to do. All right. So I'm not sure. Yeah. So this is, I think, my goal here is to figure out who, who does this apply to and what are we doing. All right. That was a summary slide. All right. So which task is automated? I think we have a little brainstorming activity here. All right, so we're going to collect uh, ideas on the board and figure out how do you interact with people that you're that are your customers or your users or your, your stakeholders? How do you interact with them? What was it? I am. I think I got a monopoly on this, apparently. <laughs> yeah, right, speak, apparently. Anyone else have any ideas? Cloud. <laughs> I don't know if you interact with your users. So you, you use the cloud, but how is it that they interact with the cloud? <laughs> cloud, OK. Let's say there's a cloud interface. And when you say exchange, do you mean two way or can it be one way? Like yeah, one way is fine. Sensors. Sensors. So how do you interact with you? Can you explain that a little bit more? Um, well, let's talk about like ICS data. Okay. Um, basically, all an engineer is doing is tapping into uh, pulling data off. Of it. Mm, how 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 is that exchanging data with your stakeholders? Well, stakeholder. Are you talking about person or you're talking about yeah, people? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so he's talking about industrial control systems, measuring like devices. I typically wouldn't consider that a stakeholder exchange. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Like a meeting. All right. I like meetings. I was in all the meetings today. All right. Alex. Paper. Oh man. Getting old school. Yeah. Right. Someone who hasn't found yet? Okay. Phone call. Oh man. So let's take an old school. All right. A text message. I love this thing. All right. Someone else? Like what? Okay, so a chat message. Well, like creating a document, right? Exchanging documents, like a Word document. Let's call it just Office documents. Yeah, and then Brad had one. Okay, all right. Well, I'm gonna chop it off there, so like no more chat messages. But all right, so these are all good. I, I like those. All right, so hopefully, let's see, did I capture anything? Web pages. Yes, web pages, those are, those are also good, right? Why did I write all these things down? Well, because my point was all of these communication channels that you're exchanging data with other people, 
those are the things that you should figure out how to automate. Right? These are the specific channels that you need to worry about. Because if you don't know how to do that, you'll have to do it manually. And, and that's just a lot of work. <laughs> Imagine, like, this is like my thought experiment, right? Imagine someone asks you to create a PowerPoint slide deck for a presentation, right? Okay, that's something I can do. Okay, I want it every single day. Really? You want to be an email every day, like a PowerPoint? That seems like a lot of work, right? That's like at least 30 minutes, right? Well, what if I had a Python program that could get the data and put it in a data structure they like, and then put it in a graph, and then put it in a PowerPoint, and send you the email every day? Then I wouldn't have to do that work, right? Like, those are identifying single sort of like, how do I make an email? How do I create a PowerPoint document? How do I send the email, right? Just break it down and then think about, can I do that? And the answer to all those is yes, which is great, <laughs> I think. <laughs> all right, so you have to basically break down your problem into the individual components and then attack those. Typically, what a business is looking for is something that looks like this, right? Excel spreadsheets, PDFs, web forms, right? Everybody loves a web dashboard, right? That's where they go to visit their metrics. Um, so you need to figure out how do I get the data there automatically so that they don't have to come talk to me all the time right, and ask me to generate a report to send them via email. So this is like, this is the goal, right? This is the output that you want to be able to deliver in an automated fashion. All right, so this is the stick to one of those. This is the problem I run into a lot, right? I'm a data scientist, I use Jupyter. People I talk to are not data scientists. They don't even know what they think Jupiter is a planet. It is, but it's not the one I care about, right? And so you have to figure out how am I going to communicate my results in a way that they can open up on their computer, right? They're running Windows. If I send them an IPYB file, they're not going to know what to do with it. They're going to think it's a virus and then they'll report. <laughs> <laughs> and that hasn't happened yet, but <laughs> I think it's a trust issue. All right. So, if I can figure out how to make an HTML web page, right, that's good. And then people can always open up HTML web pages because they have web browsers on their computer. That's like guaranteed, almost every computer. And then one extra step that I'm gonna throw in there, you can take an HTML page and make a PDF from that. Now you may already know that, do it in a way that you don't have to like get any buttons. It just does it. All right, let's see if we can pull up those examples. So, by the way, the, the, the person there was the, the coworker who's confused about IPYB. That didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, I forgot to change it out of the dark theme. My apologies. Is, should I, so, question, this is like a break here. Should I change this back to like actual uh, white text or is this significant? Yeah, let's see. Um, I'm going to see if I can make that one. All right. I'll definitely have to come back to this. But it's annoying. All right. There's some settings in here. Text editor. There we go. I think. Whew. Word. What was that? Yeah. All right. So better contrast. But so. So this is using a library called uh, Jenga. Um, so I'm just going to run all this stuff. And then the kernel, reset run all. And so I'm going to play with a web page that I sort of like manually create here. And, and the trick here is that this web page is written in HTML. And it has uh, some brackets that normally wouldn't be part of HTML. So Jenga has its own like domain specific language that allows you to template things. So what that means is it's not actually pure HTML. It's HTML with a little bit of extra code in there that Jenga interprets for you, right? That's the Jenga library. And you see this as HTML plus its own little markup language inside HTML. And so what it does is it will take so this first little example here, if I can make it bigger. So basically, I'm taking, and this will not be on your homework, so don't bother memorizing this. But I'm taking my, my Jenga command. I'm going to convert this HTML web page that I wrote there. I'm going to pass it a variable where the title is a string. 
And then what it does is it creates the actual HTML from um, the template that I used with the variable that I substituted. Right? So with a little bit of creativity, you can figure out, well, I can inject random things into a page and make HTML. That's a good thing, right? So it means you can take your variables from Python and load them into an HTML output. All right, so this goes off in, into crazy land. So um, based on my time, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time. But basically, you can take uh, a file. Let's see if I can open up. All right, so this is this text file is a combination of like text and Jenga syntax for uh, the template. And I'm going to inject that into, and, and this is just showing how the template can work on other files, but uh, you can include that in your HTML code. So you can have like a template of HTML with Jenga in it, and then read that in, put, put your variables in it, and then write the HTML. So Jenga supports things like having a dictionary and loading the, a dictionary into uh, its template as inheritance. Has anyone here not heard of inheritance? All right, so this means that I can uh, construct a web page that references other web pages. So like, let's say, typically on a web page, you'll have like a header section, content, a navigation bar, and maybe a footer. Right? And if I generate a whole bunch of web pages, I want the same header with the same footer and the same navigation bar on every web page. Rather than trying to manually do that, I can say, like, this is the header. I'm going to use this on every web page. I'll just write that once. But I'm going to reference it in all the other web pages. That's what this is showing here. The include statement says, use that other HTML snippet in this document. And that's, that's correct. Yeah, that's a Jenga specific feature allowing you to inherit from other web pages. All right, so that's just a little demo of that I can inject a consistent sort of like markup, and it generates pure HTML, right? So the, the nice part is you're passing variables into this library, and it passes up. It provides you with a pure HTML function or a file. All right. And then like the funny thing is like if you want to create a list, like normally you'd want to create a list element at a time manually. Jenga can do that, and it's all dynamic, so it's pretty exciting. But, all right. So I think. The point there is that from Python, I can create an HTML file. That means I can inject images, I can inject tables, I can inject variables, I can put strings in there. Whatever you want to include from Python into an HTML page, this is a way to do that. And this is certainly not the only way. Mm. So the question was, is there CSS support? I'm not sure if it's in Jenga, but I'm wildly confident that it would show up in some HTML rendering library, because there's so many of them. Okay. What was that? Ah, the, so you wanted to see the output. It's in the notebook. So for instance, uh, sorry? Or about it? Ah, yeah, yeah, sorry. So so the question there is like, this is the the template that I'm using, and then I run the Jenga function, and this is the the actual HTML code I get. And so I think what you're asking is, can I now go place this in a file? And the answer is yes. Normally, you'd save that string to a file, like writing it in a variable. I'm just going to quickly manually to show you what it sort of looks like. Let's see if I can get Maybe I just have Firefox. I was trying to open it with a browser and sign it. Week five. Okay, so this that web page, the code that I wrote, looks like that in a web browser. Does that answer your question? 
Okay. Exhaustively. All right. Good. So the next, so all of that, probably not like you typically won't send another user an HTML file. That's not the most common format to give people. More commonly, you'd want to give them a PDF, right? So I would I would recommend first creating an HTML page, laying it out with the, a presentation that you want to have, and then saving that to uh, a I don't know which one did I use? Saving it to a PDF. All right, the one that I'm going to use is XHTML. All right, so this this notebook basically takes. Let's see. Yeah, so there's a whole bunch of code in there. Basically, it, it takes HTML like this, and then just converts it to PDF. Like it's pretty straightforward. So you can imagine taking Jenga, generating your HTML page. Passing it off to XHTML, and this is so this is some boilerplate code that I stole off the web, obviously. Um, and then I pass it the HTML that I'm going to write, and I open that PDF um, with with the conda. So that's I'm going to show you what the output of this this HTML file. Like normally, I just say the word hello, but we're going to look at the report PDF. This this is a fully formatted HT, uh, PDF, right? But it just contains the word that I wrote from HTML in Python. Everybody getting that logic sequence? Like we're making content, we're saving it to a PDF. So we've got now an attachment. We could send an email. I think, yeah, that's it. So basically, you take HTML, save it to a PDF. Pretty straightforward. Not that one. All right. And and by the way, so because I think because this task is super common and there's a ton of ways of of implementing it, there's a ton of different libraries that support this functionality. So my my goal is just to show you that it exists and it's pretty straightforward. Like the number of commands that I had to execute to get an HTML file and then to convert that HTML file into PDF, very small, right? So it's, it's the tricky part is if you want it to look fancy, like if someone like spent a bunch of time writing it. That'll take a lot of work and time to make it look appropriate. And you have to know HTML. That's an issue. All right, as I mentioned, so I mentioned this earlier, but I'll reemphasize it. it. This applies to both uh, scheduled and ad hoc reports. So think about that. All right, so now we're going to demonstrate uh, a few more examples of how to implement automation that I've been referring to. So this is a, a pretty common use case, is that just like someone likes to work with PDFs, for whatever reason, I'm not a huge PDF fan, people love to work with Excel. And this is going to end up being your homework, so I will not have a demo of it. But the idea is your office worker you know, is you know, spending a lot of time in an Excel spreadsheet. They're making formulas, right? they're formatting cells. They have pictures in there. They have hundreds of tabs. You know, megabytes of data in their single Excel spreadsheet, it's a lot of work. And so the danger is you swoop in, you know pandas. Like, and so you're like, great, everything's in a table form, I'll just grab it out of Excel, right? And you can do that, like, no question that. Like, you can take the data out of Excel, load it in pandas. That's totally reasonable. The hard part is, let's say you do your transformations, and now you want to dump it back into Excel. What happened to all the formatting? The charts, right? The, the formulas, all that work that was, was invested is lost. Because normally the data frame doesn't contain any of those things. So now you've got a problem on your hands, right? Because you want to get the data back into a format typically that the user is comfortable with. They're not comfortable with notebooks, they're not comfortable with pandas, they don't know what the data frame is, like you're all gobbledygook to them. And so you have to figure out how do you get it back into that original format without disrupting their work. Does that use case make sense? Like, we've got a lot of work in the spreadsheet. You can't simply just retype all the formulas. So, I think, uh, yeah. So the goal here is there are some libraries that exist which allow you to sort of like gingerly manipulate the Excel spreadsheet without disrupting it. So that's a that's a really handy skill, right? When you go to not just like get data from someone, but to get the data back. 
especially in the format that they're used to working with. So that's what your, your homework is going to be, is to manipulate an existing spreadsheet that has formulas and charts and tabs, right? And you're going to have to change that spreadsheet without disrupting the work that has already been done in the spreadsheet. That's tricky. That's going to be hard for you. <laughs> Question? I'm giving you the Excel spreadsheet. It has all that, you know, I, I spent years on that spreadsheet. Please don't break it, right? That's the goal. <laughs> the good thing is, like, if you do break it, you can just download another copy from Blackboard, right? I mean, like, it's not like a one-time thing. Like, this is a great thing about electronic documents. There's not just one copy. <laughs> when you, so the point is, when you submit, you're only going to be submitting your notebook to back me on Blackboard. And so I will be running that notebook against my copy of the Excel spreadsheet and making sure it doesn't break my spreadsheet. But it's going to have to make the changes in the spreadsheet. OK, so that's to say there are libraries that exist. I'm going to recommend OpenPyXL. It's an easy one to start with. And you don't actually, so for the assignment, just to be clear, you don't actually need to use pandas to do these transformations. So, but uh, that, that's just an observation. All right, we'll come back to that at the end of the class and describe more of the actual requirement. So this next one, uh, this is always a little stressful because it relies on Google working. Google typically works, so uh, I'm going to try and send an email. This will be like the, the big exciting uh, demo for the evening, if the other ones weren't exciting for you. Send an email. All right, let's start off with this guy. All right, that question, has anyone sent an email? through a programming interface before? Yes, what did you use? What is it? PSQL? PLSQL, to send an email? Awesome, OK. What What was the server that you were connecting to? It was like a, a server at your work? FTP. But So you didn't send an email, then you sent the file? Hmm. Okay. Awesome. So sending. So what Sophia was describing is that she was able to send an email and include an attachment, which is like that's if you can pull that off, right? Like you've literally been able to automate most of the, I don't say like hours worth of work that an office worker typically spends per day, right? Like checking email, reading email, sending attachments. Like that's a big thing. So that's good. All right. So we're going to demonstrate a library here called SMTPLib. Simple Mail Transfer Protocol Library, if you're familiar with that protocol. All right, so I'm going to connect. So quick lesson on SMTP. This is the way that your email servers interact. Right? So you have, like, on your phone, typically your computer, a, uh, an email client. It's, re it's interacting with a remote server hosted somewhere. And this is the communication call that it's using. So. Yes, so that's a good question. So SMTP provides a default port, and I think it's at 443. But for secure, um, so like over HTTPS, that's your question. So if you're using TLS, I think um, it's 587. So I'm not sure why. So, but that's a thing that you would look up in the SMTP standard, which is linked here. So you can look in this. So request for comments or how internet standards get sort of set. And so this is the SMTP standard. Now the protocol, the protocol determines the port that you're running. It's kind of a nuance, but it's both a port. It's a same thing. So this is the great thing about email, because so let's say you're you're at your you know work.com website, right, and you're sending emails. It has to communicate with every other email server on the earth, right, to get your email to that other person. And so because of that, there needs to be a consistent way of communicating between email servers, which is why there is a standard. So think, just imagine, like, before email existed, someone had to think of, like, okay, there could be email. We'd have to set a standard and then get every single person on Earth to agree to it. That's not a big undertaking, right? And, like, luckily the internet was pretty small, so there wasn't a large number of people convinced, but they did it. Um, and so that's how we have SMTP, the way of making sure everybody's using the same protocol to exchange email. There are also RFCs for like HTTP, like all the other protocols you use on the web, SSH, 
FTP, right? All these protocols, everyone has to be speaking the same language, and that's where those are set. RFC is a great resource if you want to read something in Pulsar. All right. So SMTP Lib is the Python library that we're going to use to send uh, simple mail transfer protocol messages. That's that's like a really nice automation hack because writing SMTP commands is painful. Okay. So I set up my server and I'm going to say use smtp.gmail.com on port 587. Gmail.com. There to some of you. Mm -hmm. All right, so the SMTP library has a function called ELO, E H L O, that's a, a throwback to a command specified in the SMTP standard. Um, and so what it does is it launches this um, uh, request to interact with Gmail, and Gmail replies back. Right? So think of, this is you watching your computer interact with Gmail. No, that's, <laughs> I get excited by these things, right? But we actually want to interact on a secure channel. We don't want to have everything crossing the entire internet in plain text, especially our password. Right? So we set up a secure session, the so start TLS. That's a, a transport layer security. And so this time, so we're telling Gmail, hey, be secure when you talk to us. And then we reissue that hello command, and we can see that Gmail replies back again. It says, hey, I'm still here, but this time, look it, it's different. Right? Let's compare those two. So that was the, the initial response from Gmail. It says, hey, I'm here. These are the services I offer. Next time, after I did, hey, let's be secure, it replied back with, hey, I have a few extra services I didn't tell you about before. Awesome. Right now, we're going to be secure, interact with our mail servers, send emails and passwords. Cool stuff. So far, so good. All right. Sending my email and my password over the secure connection. Crap, I get an error. All right. So this isn't normally going to happen for you. If you're not using Gmail, you should have success at this point. The reason this is erroring out, let's go to the bottom of the error message. All right, here's the error message. Username and password are not accepted. Learn more at this website. So this is Gmail basically replying back to your request and saying, hey, we don't accept passwords here anymore. That's weird, right? But <laughs> most servers do. So if you have an Exchange server at work, right, or at school even, like I think, so unfortunately, UMBC uses Gmail for their email hosting. So this is applicable here. But for most campuses, they have their own email server. And businesses have their own email server, right, unless you're using Google Drive. But, all right, and then supposing that that had worked, successfully and you weren't using Gmail, this is where you would send an email in Python. So that's the code. It's something that you can use on your server if you're not using Gmail. Questions on that? All right. I, I, you know, this email under-delivered, so this notebook under-delivered because it didn't actually send an email. So we're going to go and look at an, an actual email sending Jupyter Notebook, which I find awesome. It only took me like two days to figure this out. I'm going to run this, and then hopefully it didn't have to be a run. All right, so there happens to be, so specific to Gmail, there is a Python library that allows you to connect to uh, the Gmail's web server, or to Gmail's email server. So there's this uh, tip package called Google API Python Client. That sounds very descriptive, right? It's a Python library that allows you to use Gmail. All right. Then you also have to use a special authentication client, OAuth 2 client. All right. So that's all good. This is the set of from statements where I'm going to import all those libraries now that they're installed. And then I'm going to try and uh, move on. But at this point, I have to take a break, essentially put a code that doesn't work in there to stop the script from running. I have to go off and manually run this, this uh, Python script that I'm going to go copy. And I'll explain what this is doing in a moment. Oh boy. Mm, yes. Okay. So in Jupyter, I opened up a terminal. 
and I navigate over to the, the directory where I'm doing my work out of, there is a Python script called authorize send gmail.py. I'll take a look at it in a moment. But basically, I'm going to run this command. Hopefully, this works. And this is saying to run this command. And then the output from that. Whew, all right. OK. So I previously authenticated and apparently remembered my authentication. But so it's what it's confirming back to me. So normally, if it said hadn't remembered my authentication request, this is me telling Gmail, hey, authorize this uh, this code to, to interact with Gmail on Ben Payne's behalf. So I happen to have a certificate that is associated with my account. And so if this hadn't remembered that I had previously run this command, it would have said, hey, you need to go to Gmail, authenticate, come back to me with a token. And then it, what it does is spits out every single uh, uh, label in my Gmail, just to de demonstrate that, yes, it really did access my account. Okay, so, so far, all we've done, so back in that previous notebook where you had to authenticate to the server, we just did that using certificates and tokens without a password. So now we've, we've cleared Gmail's hurdle of logging in without a username or password. That's what that script did. All right, and to look at that script, it's just a bunch of code that I stole off of Google's instructions on how to log into Gmail. Basically, what it's doing is it's taking this token.json file that I grabbed out of my account and then uh, passes it to Gmail servers and then authenticates as me without the username and password. So that's all it does. And then if it is successful, it sends back all the labels from your email account. Questions on that? That's, that's a little bit of a deep dive into the authentication process. Not super relevant at this point. All right. Now we're going to resume actually running code. The next thing that I have to explain is that uh, emails aren't sent in plain text. I apologize for the confusion, but it's a true statement. Right? They're, they're sent in base 64 encoding. We talked about encoding a few lectures ago. I don't actually know the reasoning behind why base 64 was chosen. But basically, all you, in, in Python, you take your input string, you tell it the encoding into base 64. It's a library. It's something you just do. I don't, I don't know the historical relevance of it. but And then another section of code that I stole from Google, right? to say, like, create the message. And this function requires you know, the usual email sort of features that you'd expect. And all it's going to do is take a dictionary that you create uh, with your parameters and then base64 encode it. So it's passing a dictionary, base64 encoded, as your message to Gmail. All right, nothing, nothing too shocking yet, I hope. All right, so I am going to run uh, with these parameters, right? So I'm going to have the sender be my UMBC account. I'm going to send it to my Gmail account. I'm going to set a subject. It's intentionally for a doctor, uh, Gmail or for other Gmail servers. Yeah, not for this. I don't know. Um, yeah. All right. Hopefully, there's nothing too embarrassing in my email. Let's see if it's empty. All right, so we've got an email. We'll mark that. So this is, I'm just previewing my inbox to show you that uh, there's stuff there, but I haven't sent anything recently to myself to pass on. All right, so I'm going to run these parameters through that function, get back a message variable. All right, so <laughs> this is the thing I'm sending. This is what it looks like, base64 encoded. Just to say, like, that's a thing. All right. Another function I stole off of Google, send a message, right? OK, so I run that. And then I think that's it. At this last cell, let's see if it runs. All right, so the last one's called send message. Let's see what our inbox is. Mm -hmm. Huh, a message. <laughs> That's cool, right? I mean, like, like, it's super simple. It's got the misspelled subject, right? So, uh, you know, it really is the thing I sent. It's got the message from Python. <laughs> All right. I think so. this will miss, like, 95% of you. But then this one person will, in this class will take this and run with it and, like, send hundreds of emails. And I apologize for the spam to everyone. So 
<laughs> right, but I mean, like, the important thing here is, oh, let's not look at that one. Yeah, that's a longer discussion. Took two days. Figured it out, though. It's all in documented in the notebook. I mean, the, the trick is Google's API is documented on the internet, so you can find documentation. Reading through it, I don't know if it was meant for humans, right? I mean, like, it was written by human, probably, maybe. I don't know. Google's got a lot of AI. All right. So that was, that was like, the big, like, exciting part, right? So I hope you all sort of stepped through and saw either, like, you're using a regular SMTP mail server or using Gmail. But either way, you can send the email from Python. And that scales up. You can send attachments, right? You can create PDFs, all of this good stuff. So going back to this list, we've covered, what have we covered? Paper, I will not cover because I don't have any for that. So we've got email. I have email twice. We actually did uh, APIs, uh, I think, getting data, right? So of course, that one. We've got that. Office doc. So we're going we're gonna to cover Excel here in your homework. So we'll say the uh, open by Excel. OK, text messages, I think, right now. Has anyone sent an email, a uh, text message automatically? One, how'd you do it? Yep. yep. Okay. So yeah, so it's sending text messages as alerts, totally normal, yep. All right, so if you're not familiar with an SMS gateway, this is like a really simple way of sending an email to a text message. Now, what did we just go over? Sending emails by Python. We can chain these together. We could send text messages from Python. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, that's kind of cool. All right. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to show you how this, let's see. Yeah, so all of these other direct SMS gateways, you can send text messages from Skype and all these other services, but what we care about are the email clients. So all the, if you haven't seen this before, it's pretty straightforward. There's one gotcha. You have to know the person's email. Yeah, sorry, you have to know the person's phone number that receives text messages, obviously. But the gotcha part is that you have to know their service provider. So like you have to know like, you know, is John using AT&T versus T-Mobile? And is Sophia using Verizon, right? Like once you know that specific piece of information, then you can send an email to the person's phone number, they'll receive it as a text message. All right. I don't know. Everybody's like, oh my goodness. Like, I was like, oh my goodness, to be the face. Right? Like, no. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I apparently did not melt anyone's mind. Missed the mark. Okay. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. So basically, we should take a break. All right. So we'll take a break. And we'll come back at 8.57, I guess. So I would definitely recommend if you have not stood up during this entire class, you should definitely stand up, because otherwise you're going to fall asleep. <laughs> so was that Yes. Yes. Okay. That's so when you go to the, if you have to approve a, a application to access your account on your behalf, and they very explicitly warn you, like, this can read all of your mail, this can read all of your mail, this can like, you know, 100 and a half, like, it's really explicit, like, the questions you're giving it, it's very dangerous. But, like, from a Python script, I could accidentally delete all of my mail. That's kind of dangerous. Thank you. 
Yes, yes, I will. Okay. Yeah, well, no, but I, I think there's a significant value in learning HTML because it applies to like everything. Like, it, I try and avoid skills that would be very narrowly useful. So I would argue HTML is one of those skills that it'll be useful for your entire life on everything you do. Like, it's a worthy investment. But I, I do, like, if someone presents me, like, here's a thing that you could learn. I'm like, will it be useful elsewhere? And they're like, no. I'm like, okay, probably not going to learn that then. Like, so that's my filter. That much. Just enough to get the work that I need done, but not enough to do it well. <laughs> but again, those, that's the language we're like, definitely worth learning. I just haven't been forced to learn it yet. But it's gen generally like a, applicable and useful elsewhere. All right, so we've covered, uh, so we created HTML pages, we created PDF from HTML pages, we sent emails, we can send text messages, we're not even done, all right? We've got like a few more to go. All right, so you'll see this point emphasized over and over, I think it was like three times in this lecture so far. The problem is the things that you do all the time and are repetitive, are typically like operating below your awareness level, right? Like they're so routine, you don't even recognize them. And that's a very tough pattern to break out of. So one way that I recommend to sort of like detect the things you're doing that could be automated and made faster, um, generally falls into this idea of the quantified self. Anyone heard of that before? 
right? So th this is the idea that like you can measure yourself, like you are your own subject, right? And you may only be one subject, but you have to be a very important subject to yourself. Right? So if you can measure yourself, you can figure out what patterns you're seeing in the data, then you can figure out how to make things better for yourself. So what's an example? Well, so <laughs> this is a project that I did over the course of a month at work. I wrote down every five minutes what I was doing at that time. That sounds <laughs> burdensome, right? It's it's a crap ton of work, right? I mean, like that's a lot of time, right? Like eight hours a day, five days a week for a month, right? Every five minutes, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> How did I get any work done? Well, <laughs> that's a different question. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the obvious shortcut here is like. If I'm working on a thing for an hour, I just throw it down that I did that thing for the every five minutes during the hour, right? I mean, like, obviously I didn't stop or like, shit, what am I doing? Like, <laughs> no, I did it for an hour, then it was on. Right? So it's a really relatively straightforward task for however long you have patience to do it for, because it gets annoying after a while. But what's the value, right? The value is after that month, you can see some patterns emerge. How many meetings do I go to per day? How many informal interactions are there per day? How much time am I spending on email? How much time am I like, you know, being reprimanded for, right? Like all these things. How much time am I spent on the bus getting between the worksite locations, right? All these sorts of things. And so once you measure those, you can say, oh, the time spent in meetings is actually good, but I'd like to cut it down to 45 minutes. So and in the meeting, I'm going to announce. I leave, you know, 50 minutes or whatever. So however you want to optimize that work, but you can find these patterns of, I spent 45 minutes on email. Was that a good investment? Maybe I should figure out how to make that faster, right? So if you measure yourself, you can figure out how to improve yourself, right? Because most of the time, it falls below the radar of just like, you sit at your computer, you check your email, you get up, it's like an hour later, you're just like, well, that was useful, right? They don't even recognize it. All right, question, <laughs> anyone done any experiments like that now? All right, all right. So next question. When to invest, right? When I when I go off and I try and automate a thing, that's time spent not doing the thing. And so there's this relatively straightforward calculation you can do to figure out is it worth it. And if you've seen XKCD before, this should look familiar. This is an XKCD comic, um, and it basically says, let's say I'm doing something uh, daily, right? And I spend 30 minutes doing it. Is that am I reading this right? Let's see. On your, so if I, if I do a thing daily and I shave off uh, 30 seconds of that, so I'm in this column and I'm 30 seconds row, I could spend, I could invest 12 hours of time towards making that task uh, 30 seconds faster and I would save time over the course of five years. So that's, that's like a huge window, right? Like if you can't figure out how to shave off uh, 30 seconds of a daily task in 12 hours, like you should probably increase your coding skills, right? Or pick a different task. But the point is, this is a pretty straightforward lookup table to figure out, okay, what task am I doing? How long am I doing it for? And then is it worth improving? If the answer is yes, then you're wasting time by not doing it. And it's a lost opportunity cost. Right. So that'll be available for your reference, and it's on the internet. All right, here's the danger. Danger is, I've shown you that you can automate a bunch of tasks. You know how to use Python. That does not imply that you should use Python to automate every task. <laughs> okay, there's, in every ecosystem that you're in, whether it's like, if you're in a physical environment, you can do mechanical automation, right? It wouldn't make sense to do Python in a physical environment, potentially. So I'm gonna show you a couple other tools. I'm gonna deviate from my normal Python bias and show you that or op automation in other environments is totally feasible. You have to know to look for the tools though, right? Typically, no one's running around advertising that they can make your job easier. You have to go like recognize, okay, this is a task I could automate. Okay, now I have to go look for a tool. It might not be Python. So that's the motive here. All right, I do have a notebook that has Selenium, which is a web browser automation tool in it. Unfortunately, it's not working, so I'm gonna have to deviate even from that. All right, so that's to say there is a 
a pat Python package called Selenium, import it, and then um, if I had this thing working, it would actually work. I would import the Selenium library, and then I could manipulate my web browser behavior from a notebook. Why would y'all want to do that? Any thoughts? Testing, okay, that's like the, the standard Selenium purpose. Any other reasons? You know, we talked about this earlier in the semester. No. So let's say you were scraping a website, right? Like getting all the content from a website. It was refusing your attempts to use pandas, your attempts to use requests, your attempts to use wget, curl, scrapey, right? They just spent all that time making sure that you couldn't scrape their website. You can still defeat that using Selenium. Like, I'm not going to question your morals on that, but it's available. All right, so let's go over a new tab. So I had so because my Python-based approach was not working, I had to switch over to this uh, Chrome plugin. So I happen to have a a browser plugin called Selenium. It does the exact same thing as the Python library, just it does it through a GUI. I almost feel embarrassed about that. Right? All right, so I wrote this little script. What the script does, you can read through it and sort of understand where is it going, right? This is a pretty straightforward script. It's going to go start at the umbc.edu website. You can read that. It's going to click on some text called a uh -uh, Albin O Kuhn Library, and then do stuff, right? Let's play it. Let's see, I think play. Run current test. So it opens up Chrome, it opens up the home page, it finds a link, it clicks on the link, clicks on find, it finds more stuff, right? So very quickly, faster than you could have done. I guarantee if anyone can beat this manually, you know, I don't I would eat a hat, but I don't have a hat. <laughs> it just got to this page using all those web clicks really fast because all it had to do was wait for that element to appear in the page. And by the time that the page is still loading, it can click on a thing. Right? So it literally clicked on the on the link before the page had finished loading. So so automation can be very fast. I I didn't do anything exciting. I mean, I, I could have just gone to this web page directly. The point was to sort of like show you the, the the visual automation process, and that should like either like scare you emotionally, like holy crap, that was scary, or like it was like exciting. I don't know which one it was for you, but all right. So that's that's just a quick, simple app in Selenium. All I had to do was like record. Like this is the setup, right? Click record, do things in a web browser, and then play back. Like it's you didn't even have to write any code. It's again super embarrassing. <laughs> all right. So that all those features you could write in Python to do more complicated things. Everything I have shown you in this class so far is free, and I think that will always be the case. Free. You can program a free box. Yes. <laughs> All right. It's the last. So this is my my bottom caveat. There is like, Selenium is your last choice, never your first. It's always your last. Right? It seems simple, and it is, but it almost always breaks. And for complicated things, it's not that simple. All right. Next thing on. So again, I'm breaking out of my Python bias, and I'm showing you things that are not Python because data science isn't just Python, right? If 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 you think you can take off your data science hat when you leave your Python environment, you're not a data scientist. You're just a programmer. You know. So so try to think of data science when you're not in Python. Let's see if I can pull up this script. So. I'm gonna. So this, this is like Ben Payne story time, right? So, so this is a tool called Automator. Let's see if I can. So an Automator is specific to Mac. Oh, uh, sorry. I wanted to open an existing one. Maybe. Automator. Right. All right. So again, th again, this should look super familiar because we just looked at Selenium. But Automator is for Macintosh computers and does basically the same thing, right? It does things like clicking, and then it gives you back this script, and it does all these things magically. So let's let's play about it, and then let's talk about it. Run, and I'm gonna be surprised if this actually completes because GUIs are a little sensitive. Did you see the mouse move? Mouse move. 
Must move. Must move. Absolutely. All right. So it crashed, but so hopefully I'm gonna I'm gonna play that back one more time while I'm talking about it, and then I uh, will talk about its ups and downs. So everybody watch the mouse basically while it's while it's running. So I'm gonna click on run. It does absolutely hijack your mouse, and it's physically moving. It's telling the computer move the mouse to these coordinates, right? And then move the mouse to the next coordinate. I'm hoping for the mind melt. I just haven't seen it yet. All right, so now it's been been pain story time. So, so back in the day, I used to um, install computers as an IT uh, support person for a large organization, and so that process involved taking a CD with the Windows XP operating system. XP is where I date myself, right? So I'm putting XP on a disk in a computer that I manually built myself physically, and forming it with the disk and then putting the operating system on it, and then installing 50 programs, right? Install, set up, click, accept, you know, license agreement, configuration, finish, next one, right? Now, how many of those do I have to do? Hmm, like a 1,000. OK, so this is where this lecture comes into play, right? So imagine you're Ben Payne doing that. Right? You, you get mindlessly bored, right? Order. If you're if you're really me, then you actually go off and look for this, right? This is where we say, okay, I'm doing this thing where I'm moving this mouse. It's the same mouse movement for the same program on a new computer. How do I automate that, right? So for those, there's a program called AutoIt, and AutoIt is its own scripting language. But when you run an AutoIt program, it moves the mouse and clicks buttons for anything, right? It doesn't care. Like this mouse movement didn't care that it's using Finder or some other application. It's just moving the mouse. And so you can do that for any application. It means any application can be odd as long as you know which buttons are going to show up, what the shortcuts are for the keyboard shortcut, that it's all automatable. So I went from something, a process that would take about 10 hours, right, manually performed by a human, and it was completely unreliable, right? Because when humans get bored, they become unreliable. And so doing the same thing repetitively means you would make a mistake, something would be misconfigured, you deploy it to the person who's sitting at the desk, and they're like, this doesn't work, and you're like, I spent 10 hours on that. Right? And so automation has this beautiful result that it's consistent. And so every time I ran that script, it would now take like mm, an hour. And every time the image was perfect. Right? Eventually, we moved to imaging computers, but then I lost all that work, whatever. <laughs> right. So the point of this was to say that you can automate things outside of your Python environment using other tools. You just have to know that the task is automatable and look at the right tool for the job. So. Selenium, for example, for web browsers, Automator for your desktop environment, right? Python for tools and sending email, that sort of thing. So questions on the like the general mindset, right? That's that's really my goal for tonight is to impart or change that mindset to you. And I really hope I got it. Yes, Travis. So and it, so, the, and by the way, so these programs of like automation can be as short or as long as you want them to be. So, an example of a really short program: suppose I get really bored of pressing like Apple C, Apple V, right? And I want to make that a shorter thing. That's how short I could make it into one key press, where I auto map sort of like a that function to a new key press. And now every time I press like JK, right? Now I'll just do this four times. Right? And if you're really doing Apple C, Apple V millions of times and you reduce it by a factor of two to two keystrokes, that's really handy, right? And it can be just that simple. So you can just do simple keyboard shortcuts that make other things shorter. And that's a way to make yourself faster, right? And fewer mistakes. Or you can have really long scripts where you're installing 50 program 50 programs with an XP operating system on a new computer. It takes hours, right? So questions on that? How secure? <laughs> you are running it as the administrator typically to install programs on a computer, so zero. <laughs> like, there's no authentication, right? You're just launching the script. It's like a bash script. You can think of it as a bash script, but for the GUI. Yeah, so, all right. That's a death separate conversation on will try. All right. All right, so just to resummarize, this is all the things we talked about. 
Hopefully that captured some of your attention. I don't know if it did all of these things. So I didn't hit any of the messenger things. I guess you could do that with a email or a typing automators. I didn't show PowerPoint, but I mentioned it. So you can create and edit Word documents and PowerPoint and Excel spreadsheets to your heart's content using Python libraries. Super cool. Okay, one more time. All right, so first is an activity. You have a half sheet of paper that has two words, one on either side. So the first thing is to say one thing that you have learned. Put that on the side that says learn. <laughs> and then there's the other side which says one question you have. And just like one sentence, it doesn't have to be super paragraphy, like long, but also legible. So I have to read these things. These are coming, so PS, these are coming to me. You are writing them to me. Dan. No, they're anonymous. And you can turn them in at the end of class when you turn in your name tag, but those are two separate files, right? Anonymous little feedback forms and your game tags. So you can continue writing the full disclaimer. These little feedback forms serve two purposes. One, for you to rethink about all the things that just happened in the last two and a half hours, right? So you're sort of gelling the content in your head by reflecting upon it. That's like task number one. Outcome number two is your feedback to me will shape how I make future presentations on this lecture. So those are the two purposes. All right. Now we're moving on to homework. So this is the situation that I was talking about. And by the way, you can keep writing. There's no information there, but you will be turning these in at the end. The situation, as I mentioned, uh, specifically, you have an Excel spreadsheet, and it has things in it. So I'm going to go look at those just to sort of cruise around with you so you can understand these words more, uh, more experientially. I have the assignment. And maybe I don't. I might not have the assignment. Yet. Let's see. Now I'm going to have to remember. I don't. Uh, sorry. I'm trying to think of where I would put it. I know I saw it. Let's see if it's. Um, All right. I may have to come back to this in a moment. Animation. Oh, you know what? I know where it is. Here. Uh, the inventory of all my documents is always fun to navigate. Let's see. All right. So this is the Excel spreadsheet. You will be able to, this will be available to you in Blackboard. So to point out some features. There's two tabs down here, main and another. Okay. And there's a picture, right, a plot of some data. And then there's some columns of data, right, and those columns have headers. Nothing too scary there. 
And then if you count on, or if you click on some of these numbers, the field is just a number, right? 52. And if we move our slider over to these other cells, some of them are formulas. Right? You could absolutely read this data as a data frame independent. No, no problem. The problem is if you try and write data back into this Excel spreadsheet from pandas, by default, it'll just overwrite everything, including the image and the formulas and the data. So that would be bad if you wanted to use this as a human. <laughs> All right. There's this other uh, tab, a worksheet called another. It has basically a sim layout, um, also a chart, and there's some formulas and everything. The, the tricky part here is that this column, PID, that's, that's supposed to be uh, somewhat overlapping with patient ID. Does that come in? Does that comment make sense? Like you should have like some of these numbers will show up in the other one and vice versa. Like there's some overlap, but they're not perfectly overlapped. So it's like the that's the the issue here that we're gonna solve using Python. Alright, so all those words are here. Then what's the assignment? Make this a little bigger. Well, what do you mean by references? No, so they're independent, yes. So that, the question he was asking is if I look at, so patient ID, all of these are just numbers. And if I look at the tab, the worksheet called another, and I look at all these, these are all just numbers. So so this would be, so where, what's the, what's the real story here, right? I'm a nurse or I'm some doctor at a hospital, right? And I have in the patient tab, like, security numbers or other patient tracking numbers that are given. And I've been keeping track of these different fields, SAM, AF, and AV, in my spreadsheet, right? And this other spreadsheet has patient data also. All right, so this other hospital group, maybe a different division or different you know, emergency department versus the, the surgeon or whatever, right? So they, they're tracking also patient ID, and they have the age and smoking, smart, and ASDF, and then Right? So they have these different fields they're tracking. That's totally reasonable, right? Like different organizations track different data, even though they're talking about the same people. And they've done their analysis in isolation. What does a data scientist do, right? Data scientist wants to look at all the data as one big table. Right? Or maybe you're trying to help a doctor trying to get things together. Right? So it turns out some of these patients show up in both tables, but some of them don't. And so what we want to end up with is I want these three fields, these three columns, sorry, to also show up here. So you're going to the like straightforward task in Python, copy those or place those cell headers in those columns, right? And then for the patients which overlap, you're going to populate those rows. And where the patients don't overlap on the main tab, you're going to insert new patient rows. Does that make sense? The hard part is, without disrupting the formulas that exist and the and the displays that exist, because you have to get it back to the people who are going to use it in the form they're used to using it. But if you gave them like some CSV, they'd be like, "That's useless." So that's this this is the hard part is like we're going to use a library that I haven't shown to you to do a task that is sounding somewhat unreasonable at this point. Right? All right. So again, these are more words that basically say that same thing. So I'm going to use this Python library. I'm going to copy the patients that exist on the, the worksheet called another to the worksheet called the main. And for patients that don't exist in main, I have to create new rows. But for patients that do already exist in the main spreadsheet, then I have to add those column entries. So in the, the point is, the worksheet called uh, another is going to be undisturbed. Like you don't you don't do anything with that, but the, the the worksheet called main you're gonna add new data to that, and some of those fields will be empty. Yeah. Uh, I'm not gonna. So that's a reasonable question. I'm not gonna force you to replot that data from Python. So, so, but that's that's basically what you're trying to enable the doctors to do, right? Like you want to be able to have them run that merge data with whatever you're gonna be doing. 
Yes. Not updated though. Good question. Also, I think this calls it out. There are formulas on the another worksheet. You don't need to copy the formulas over to the main worksheet. Right? That is possible, but again, I'm not forcing you into that situation because it's a lot of extra work. So at this point, we're just copying values from the another worksheet to the main worksheet. Good? Okay, so no changes on the another. And then the last sort of like observation is I want you to produce a new Excel spreadsheet. So basically, it's a copy of the original. You don't overwrite the original, and you, you make a copy of that into a new Excel spreadsheet. But it should have all the old data in it. Mm, yeah. And I think that's everything I said. Yeah. So this should be uh, programmatic. Like, like don't just like look at all the data, write it in Python, and then like. Uh, does that make sense? Like you have to actually cycle over the rows. <laughs> that's one sort of like issue because really the patient data that you'd see in real life is thousands of rows. So like manually copy over cell by cell, that's not the goal. All right. So. Now it's time to do the work, right? But on paper. So you have to think, what are all the things I've just told you? How are you going to do them? If you need paper, let me know and I'll give you some paper. But we're going to design our solution to this problem before we do it. We need paper. And the, and the problem here is you haven't even looked at it. You haven't even looked at the Open IXL library yet, right? So you haven't seen what it can do. So I'm asking you to design your approach to the homework without having an idea of the functionality already present in Open IXL. <laughs> if you're thinking that it's unreasonable, um, the point is to give you an expectation of like, I want to do this thing. Then you'll have to figure out, does it exist in Open IXL? Or do I have to write it myself, right? That, that's a later decision independent of the design of how you approach this problem. No. Sorry? Having used these libraries, sometimes there are language things that you can include that would make your life as useful. Yes. Yeah. Dan, yeah. question? Yeah. Any of the requirements to use that library to change the library? Because mm. I'll, I'll strongly advocate that that's the easiest one that I'm aware of. You're certainly welcome to look at other libraries that would meet the same requirements, but I'm not aware of too many of them. Sorry? Yes. Yep. And if you want, I can pull up in the Excel spreadsheet. No. That's good. The, the another tab is undisturbed. So the, the resulting worksheet has two tabs still, one of the main, the other another. Uh, if you want to look at the Excel spreadsheet, give me a shout and I'll pull it up. You say uh, the formulas in the cell already? In both sheets, some of the columns have cells, uh, have formulas, yes. But you don't need to copy the formulas over to the new sheet, to the, to the main sheet. You copy by the. Yeah. You'll be adding new columns in the main sheet and adding new rows. So the original data won't be disturbed. Sorry, 
Okay. I'm going to start from the top. And so the time, stop me when you don't understand the words I'm saying. All right. So we have a spreadsheet, an uh, Excel spreadsheet. It has two tabs. It has main and has another. I'm going to switch between those two. So the, the main and another, they have different content. And so main has its patient ID column. Another has a P underscore ID column. So think of these as actual patients as an identifier for the patients. Yeah. So, so we do our joint, whatever dot, whatever dot com is in that, it's going to be null for all the issues. Exactly. So, correct. So, so, so your, your diagnosis is that. So that, that could be, so that would be the, so let's take a look at this. So this formula that would get disrupted relied on cells that you're going to add. But it turns out that all of the formulas only reference cells that are already populated in this sheet. So I'm saying it will actually add values, you know, that are the main, that are the other. And I guess if you look correct, I can call it that's, so that's not that you're going to fall outside of the chart. You mean the graph? Yeah, so sorry, the graph. Yeah, the, yeah so the, the graph currently is sucking values from, I don't even know if I can edit that. In Excel, I would be able to edit that. But Anyways, so this spreadsheet is drawing values from the ones that exist. So it's not going to change based on the new rows and columns you had. So you're adding columns and you're adding rows to main. Correct. Yes, even if you reran the plot, it wouldn't. Okay. Uh, started. How, how are we doing? Are you still in the? Good. Okay. So then, the 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 issue is, some of these columns, like age, smoking, smart, yep, yeah, those don't exist in the another worksheet. And so you're going to have to create those those columns in the main worksheet because you want to copy the values of this patient data over the main worksheet. So, for instance, this patient here, I don't know whether they exist over in main, but if they did, then I'd have to add the data from NAM, CAP, and AV over to here. So that's a, that's for a patient where they they do exist in both worksheets. Some patients only exist on this. So let's look at I don't know if one one one. Yeah, so one 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 does not exist as a patient record on the main worksheet. So I would have to add one 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 as a patient. These will all be blank, and then these will be populated with the values from another. Good, I think. That covers the goal. Okay. Sorry? That's correct. All right. So that was the description of the homework. It is complicated. <laughs> That's what I do. I mean, like, sorry. All right. So you, if you've designed the solution to your homework, once you start looking at OpenPyXL, you'll say, like, are the functionality that I require for my design implemented in OpenPyXL, or is this something I have to do myself? Right? That's the, the question there. OK. I, and that's all I have for now. Any other questions before we finish up? I will take your half sheet with the learning question. And I'll take your, uh, your name tag in a separate file. Thank you. Thank you.